Hey, welcome to the Lincoln Network podcast, where you can find a wide variety of conversations on technology, democracy, and congressional reform in Washington, D.C. You can watch these conversations on YouTube, and you can also find them wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hello, everyone. I am here with my colleague, Dan Lips, who is the Vice President for National Security and Government Oversight at Lincoln Network. And we're also joined by Klon Kitchen, who is a resident fellow at AEI, but most importantly for internet purposes, writes an amazing Substack newsletter called The Kitchen Sink. So we'll order that whichever direction uh, Klon likes that. But uh, thank you for joining me. I think what we're going to try to do today is resolve all of the issues attendant with uh, China and technology in 30 minutes or less. So this should be very, very, very straightforward. Um, yeah, we'll have time to hang out afterwards. Yeah, of course. Uh, time to hang out afterwards in 20 minutes or so. I, I want to start basically here, Klon, especially with the news of Apple and Apple's entanglement with the Chinese government and the various trade-offs that have been obviously going on there. There's really great reporting in the New York Times on this. Where would you say the broad sta state of play in this overall space of China, national security and technology? How would you really say it is? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I would say that technology is has become one of the key defining variables that's going to you know, shape the geopolitical environment, and that it is absolutely uh, a key variable in the relationship between the United States and China. Um, and I think, you know, the United States is either going to get policy with China right, or it's going to get a lot of other things wrong. And, uh, and that requires uh, some really careful thinking about, about tech. So in the case of, you know, you mentioned Apple, and I'm sure we'll go into it in more detail. But <clears throat> the first point on that is that it's not just Apple. It's every technology company that operates in China, and it's every Chinese company, regardless of whether or where it operates. So how they treat data and the expectations that the Chinese Communist Party has on those countries or on those companies uh, is broadly shared. It just so happens that the New York Times is reporting on Apple, and I think that reporting was particularly impactful because of the way Apple has positioned itself. But the short answer to your question is, is yeah, tech is a key variable and it's going to keep being that way for a long time. What would you add to that, Dan? I agree. And I think that um, it's one of the unique areas of um, bipartisan agreement in national politics that this is a, an issue of major concern. As we're having this conversation right now, the Senate is uh, debating and uh, looking to move you know, major legislation, uh, really aim to improve American competitiveness and technology research and development. Also um, importantly, trying to safeguard American research centers from Chinese and other nation state espionage. In 2021, there's a few things that uh, you see you know, pretty strong bipartisan agreement on in Capitol Hill, but this is one of them. Yeah, so over the course of the last four years in the previous administration, there were all of these different movements on various policy issues. But Dan, I think you said it well, one of those areas where just a clear bipartisan consensus emerged was on the China issue, especially in the technology sector. The big question that I want to focus on today then is what now? So we get it. There's a clear consensus. There's very little disagreement on this. Colin, starting with you, what would you say the priorities would be if we're focusing on this area? Well, there's a lot of work to do. And uh, a lot of aspects of this have, you know, a similar level of importance. But um, one thing that I would like a greater appreciation of and a commitment to engage is we have to continue doing the kind of whack-a-mole strategy where we find a, you know, a, a Chinese company that's, you know, integrated deeply into the U.S. economy and we've got to figure out what that means and secure that. Like, that's all important and we have to do that work. Um, but more broadly, I, I wish policymakers would internalize and accept as kind of an orienting framework the idea that, that China is pursuing a grand strategy. So the way I talk about this is China is trying to pioneer a new model of governance. Like they have, they have a view about how the state should work and how society should work. And what they wanna do is they want to marry up their version, of the, the wealth that's created by their version of managed um, capitalism 
coupled with the stability and the government authority of totalitarianism. And they understand that key emerging technologies are gonna be the key enabling capability for both of those aspects of this new model of governance. And, and I think that is the best and frankly, the only rational way to understand what China is trying to do. And I think if you get that, then you're a lot closer to making coherent, rational, sustainable policy as it, as it regards China. Um, and then the final point that I would make on that is that if, if what I'm saying is true, then you don't have to believe that every Chinese company is evil or malevolent, right? Not, now, Huawei, I think, is terrible, but not every Chinese company is Huawei. A lot of Chinese companies would love just to be kind of normal participants in the global free market. But at the end of the day, because of what we know about the CCP, they don't have to be malevolent. They only have to be compliant with Chinese law. And Chinese law is very clear, it's knowable. And the reality is that if you're not compliant with Chinese law, you're not gonna be in business law. So I think if policymakers understood those two things, then we could start making some real meaningful difference over the mid to long term. Dan, you're very focused on the congressional side of a lot of these debates. How would you say that picture is looking from a forward looking perspective? I mean, I think that there's um, growing recognition of the grand strategy challenge that Klan talked about. Uh, I think there's you know, broad agreement in some of the areas I mentioned earlier in, involving increasing uh, investment in R&D to be able to compete with uh, Chinese state industrial policy that's aimed to try and achieve uh, independence and superiority in key tech areas. There's a certainly growing bipartisan uh, concern about humanitarian uh, challenges in China, um, including addressing you know, supply chain questions of um, the, the computer that I'm speaking to you through could have been you know, made by forced labor. Um, it's, a, it's an alarming um, problem that we all have to grapple with. There's been a, a bipartisan push to, to, um, to prevent that and to try and you know, require US companies to um, you know, disclose more about their supply chains and to, to restrict that type of activity. I think also that the, to emphasize something that, that Klan mentioned, you know, the part about authoritarianism that um, China's trying to marry into this grand strategy is, is likely to be um, advanced through a digital authoritarianism. Tech companies, um, whether it's Apple or others, um, allowing customer data to be exposed to the Chinese government, that goes hand in hand with the human rights abuses that are going on there, the censorship that we're all concerned about, um, and a global effort to you know, promote the um, PRC's worldview. Um, I'm encouraged that there's a lot of uh, bipartisan consensus around these ideas though there's a lot more work that needs to be done to try and put solutions into practice to address them. Yeah, and that's the perfect place to follow up on something that I'm sure is on everyone's mind, which is when we're talking at the high level, that's where all of the agreement and the, I'd say the consensus is going to look. But when you look at what happened with TikTok last year, you see when we get into the nitty gritty details, you could, have all the, you could have all the broad agreement in the world, but it could fall apart and lead to basically nothing very quickly. So I'd like an answer on this from both of you, starting with you, Klan. What would you say the lessons for any policymaker interested in addressing the issue we're talking about? What are the lessons from, let's just editorialize a bit, the TikTok debacle, um, at least from my perspective, are? Yeah, so I think one of the key things that undermined uh, the TikTok conversation, and I think was a, a huge frustration for conversation about Huawei, is be clear and consistent about what your concerns are. And then as you engage it, make sure that you're, you're treating it with the seriousness that it demands. So for example, um, you know, with, with, with Huawei and 5G, the president would come out and I think very rightly, strongly talk about the national security concerns that were, that were driving you know, many of the policy decisions. But then occasionally it would be, but we'll put all those sanctions away uh, and maybe we can figure out something out if you guys will just buy more soybeans, which you know, completely upended the notion and, and it rightly caused skeptics to say like, okay, so this isn't really national security. This is some type of, you know, kind of protectionist trade policy this doesn't make sense. Well, the same thing happened with TikTok, right? So TikTok was talked about as like, look, this big deal. I went on 60 Minutes and talked about this, right? And, and it's a huge deal. It's a problem. Um, but then the way the president, you know, kind of engaged the, the negotiations between 
you know, ByteDance and originally Microsoft and then later Oracle and the way he seemed to kind of favor one and want to squash the other and never really saw it through. It was just a big mess, right? And and I would say that any policymaker who who gets it, who who buys in and says like, look, there, there are legitimate things that I am concerned about. Great. Two things you need to be aware of. One, you're going to be under a lot of pressure. The Chinese are going to come after you in terms of trying to convince you about why this is a bad idea. All the companies are going to come at you and they're going to spend millions of dollars just the way that ByteDance did and the way Huawei did and everybody else. And then two, you're going to have U.S. economic interests coming after you because, you know, you're, you're going to be, you're messing with their, with their garden and, um, and they have views on this. And, and those views are important to uh, American society and, and even national security, but they don't always appropriately appreciate the full picture. And so policymakers who do this need to, uh, you know, understand this themselves, but then also speak about this coherently and, and not like start trading it away over what I would call lesser things. I'd agree with that. I think another lesson that I would urge policymakers to, to think about is the need to be focused and discreet on um, what threats we're trying to address. Um, while uh, TikTok was uh, you know, dominated the some of the news in this space last year, um, uh, under the radar, there was efforts to try and you know, prevent technology transfer in the semiconductor sector, where there was more discreet use of export controls against known companies with ties to the uh, Chinese um, state and military. Um, I think it undermines credibility when you know, all Chinese companies are you know, get in the news and then are, are labeled as, as problematic. Um, but uh, there are ways to do this wisely um, that, and focus more, you're using a scalpel to address your real security challenges. Yeah, I want to pick up the nuance there because both of you refer to the idea that it's not as if the claim is that every single Chinese company attempting to compete and enter the market is inherently a problem. How should we delineate between the really problematic ones like Huawei and more neutral ones where there isn't quite clearly as much of a tie there? Because what makes this difficult obviously is most if not all Chinese companies obviously will have some sort of tie to the Chinese Communist Party. So how should we sort through these categories if we're rank ordering? So I'm actually maybe making a slightly different point than Dan, if, if the way you're describing it is, is right. So I think that virtually every Chinese company is still going to have the problem associated with it of Chinese civil military fusion. So every, every Chinese company is going to be subject to Chinese law. Now, what I was saying is that I don't think that every Chinese company has to be you know, evil, or I don't think that they're malevolent in their intent. Um, but if, if they're headquartered in China and they want to do business, they're subject to Chinese law. And Chinese law is very clear that every bit and byte of data that transits, that is stored on or otherwise touches a network of the, one of these companies or their subsidiaries operating anywhere in the world must be made available to the Chinese government upon request, period. And so there's no one who escapes that. Now, that doesn't mean that we then have to kind of treat every industry and every company as equal concerns, right? There are definitely, there's definitely a gradation and variation there and, and we should be smart about that. Um, but there is a persistent and I think universal concern uh, that comes with Chinese companies operating in the US marketplace and with US companies operating in the Chinese marketplace that we're going to have to deal with. I agree with that. I would just add that you know, part of the, um, the issue and question that policymakers must be grappling with is the consequence of that type of partnership, of that type of service. You know, with Huawei, the, the risks are, are obvious. With our um, uh, semiconductor supply chain, you know, we, we know that there's a great risk of tech transfer and they're trying to build industries you know, based on uh, American innovation. Um, I think that's where the focus needs to be on thinking through the consequence of what that partnership with the Chinese government entails and uh, the, the consequence of you know, that, uh, that relationship and the loss of, uh, of potential um, information and sensitive technology. Well, hey, Marshall, let me give you an example of one that I think is on the horizon, something I've been kind of peeling the onion on here recently. Um, I think that, that there may be another Chinese company who could easily be the next Huawei when it comes to um, the internet of things or IoT. So 
three weeks ago, a Chinese company called Tuya, um, which is an IoT platform, got listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and then they subsequently raised over $915 million of additional funding. And I'm still working on all the details, but I think they may constitute the largest IoT platform in the United States and possibly globally. Well, as we deploy 5G, one of the pre-promises, one of the key promises of 5G is actually having the data pipes to support real IoT development and deployment. Well, if we do that, and a Chinese company is the one who's providing the bulk of the IoT platform that's running on 5G, well, great that we didn't let Huawei build the 5G, but all the IoT devices are running on a Chinese platform, and so we've still got the underlying data concerns. So, like we have to be thinking about this. And if we're only waiting until um, you know it's been identified and we're halfway down the road, that's obviously not gonna work for us. And so trying to think through this is, uh, is, is, is what I'm spending my time on and, and the kind of forward leaning thinking that we need policymakers to be engaged with. Yeah, let's actually build on that idea. I'll throw to you first, Dan. What are the areas within the technology industry that we should all be thinking about. So obviously 5G was just referenced, Internet of Things was just referenced. What are those, I mean, we're referencing TikTok, so social media is there. What are the broad areas where we're gonna start seeing these tensions and dynamics come up? I mean, I think it'll, you'll see it across the board where we um, uh, really anywhere we see um, uh, technology enabling devices. Um, I think that there's always being that risk of information going back to, to China. I think that there's um, one of the things that's been discouraging is that uh, many of these concerns have been brought to light uh, years ago, and that there's a you know, five to ten year lag about um, concerns like Huawei and ZTE. I think it's smart to be to be thinking ahead. Um, I think that there's a, a big challenge is um, uh, as AI. The AI Commission report came out earlier this year, looking at you know, China is trying to develop um, you know, to become the world's leader in AI um, in the, the coming decades. I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing a lot of uh, across the board agreement and more R&D funding to try and compete in these, these spaces. Um, but I think that the, the, it's, the, the, the challenge is so comprehensive that it's difficult to pinpoint exactly what the technological you know, priority should be. Yeah, how about you, Khan? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to agree with what Dan said in terms of, you know, all the buzzword techs are going to be critical, you know, AI, robotics, all that. Um, and, and again, the reason why that is, is that China is rationally pursuing geostrategic influence, and it understands that to get that influence, it needs to lead or be a leader in a couple of key technologies. I think they're right. I think the United States has largely made the same assessment, right? And, and it's a coherent way to operate in the international system. Um, so they're going to be as comprehensive in their approach as they can be. Now, they've put out strategies that identify kind of T10 key tech sectors, including all the ones that we've named, plus things like additive manufacturing and advanced agriculture and telecommunications, that kind of thing. Um, I think another one that we're probably not thinking about too much right now is going to be commercial space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody sees what's going on right now with uh, SpaceX and, you know, their ability to do reusable launch vehicles. And they've got their um, Starlink satellite uh, constellation that they're deploying. Um, space is already crowded. It's going to get even more crowded. And I think um, space-based capabilities, including internet capabilities, are going to be a, a, another area of, um, of real competition between us and, and multiple nations. I want to take this back to where we started, which was the conversation about Apple. And what really matters there is, you all both articulated, is that this is part of a longer tradition of tensions between the priorities of companies and the Chinese government, all those sorts of things. What if anything, will, do you think will come out of basically the big news on this this week? Or is this basically just going to be another additional example of just long underlying tensions that are going to continue to simmer for a long time? One thing I'd like to see is some you know, fact finding. I think that the um, New York Times story and Apple's response raises some questions about um, yeah, the specifics of what the risks is to Apple's customers um, in China and here, um, 
those who interact with with uh, people in China. I think it would be a, a good area for Congress to hold a hearing um, to get to, bottom, to the bottom of some of these issues. Um, I, I do think that this is a, um, a longstanding challenge that all companies face, but um, when it's given the gravity of what we know is happening with digital authoritarianism um, in China, it's, it's certainly something that we need to understand the, 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 the true scope of the problem. Yeah, I think, I think the New York Times report is primarily a public relations problem for Apple. Uh, I think they're big enough to where their usual strategy of just kind of button up and weather it will probably work for them if there's not uh, a additional effort done. So, you know, Dan mentions the idea of a, of a congressional uh, hearing potential. I mean, that would definitely move the ball a little bit. That would that would take this a little further, even if they decided not to show up as they've done in the past. I think that would provide, <clears throat> I think that probably wouldn't work out well for them this time. Um, I think Tim Cook deserves the opportunity to explain himself. I mean, by all re reporting, he's the architect of um, Apple's expansion into China. I mean, from a logistics standpoint and from a market standpoint, there can be no doubt that what Apple has done in China has enabled them to be the juggernaut that they are. Um, and, you know, when all that was happening, maybe it wasn't as clear to everyone what the trade-offs were going to be, but they're certainly clear now. And so if Tim Cook has a good answer, then I would love to hear it. And I think he deserves the opportunity to, to, to share that. Um, but, you know, as I've said previously publicly, is like, you know, as, as Apple and other companies are making these decisions, they're no longer only affecting their bottom lines. They're affecting American national security. And so I think Congress has a right to, to call them in and, and have questions. I don't think it has to be inherently hostile. Uh, I do think those questions would apply to a lot of companies, not just Apple. But um, the reason why it is especially, I think, impactful in the context of Apple is because Apple's gone out of its way to position itself as the virtuous tech company who really cares about human rights, who really cares about privacy, and uh, they're not afraid to uh, preach to everyone about that. And uh, I think it's pretty clear to me that their operations in China would justifiably cause some quizzical looks in light of that posture, and uh, I'd love to hear their answers. What advice would you both give to corporations or basically any market-oriented entity that's participating or seeking to participate in the Chinese market? Not every company is going to have Apple's ability to weather the storm. So how would you advise they, not tactically, but just how should they approach the space when you're thinking about it? I think it's at least, um, it'd be important to recognize the, the gravity of the concerns, um, both the humanitarian concerns of what's happening with the genocide that's ongoing and uh, over there, uh, also the security concerns, which, which have been apparent, but you know, become more apparent every day as we see what's happening in Hong Kong. Um, I think that it's, it, uh, companies do have a moral obligation to um, understand what they're sacrificing by um, pursuing the market opportunities there and particularly um, complying with with uh, Chinese law as as they must um, it, it's we can no longer ignore these trade-offs I think that we have to be have a really honest conversation about them yeah uh, look I I think while the Chinese market may be lucrative uh, at least it has been uh, it's also a moral minefield and ultimately I think a dead end for Western companies um, those companies that, that submit to Beijing's predatory demands on intellectual property and proprietary information and other data, um, they weaken American economic competitiveness. Uh, they weaken individual and national cybersecurity uh, and, uh, and, and broader national security as well. And then to the degree that this capitulation enables China's strategy of, of technological ascendance over the United States, you know, that's a big deal. And, and an American company's participation uh, in all of that uh, also tends to give cover to Beijing's political and human rights violations. Um, I think not only that, I think the business risk is, is extreme too. So it, China has a proven record of allowing US companies to take part in their market for only as long as it is required to pilfer from them their intellectual property and secrets. And then once they've, 
they've gotten all that, Beijing caps that company's market presence and then prioritizes their domestic competitors and they get pushed out. Um, so I just think that the, the days when intellectual property theft and, and, and dealing with the Chinese government was just kind of a tax of doing business in China, uh, I don't think that that math works out anymore. Uh, I think that a lot of, of companies are beginning to understand that. Uh, and I think also the understanding that of their vulnerability in terms of supply chain security is also factoring in. So I'm guardedly optimistic that we're going to move in a, in a more sustainable direction, but we're not there yet. And uh, I am a strong advocate of keep turning the screw until we're where we need to be. Yeah. So the last question for both of you, I'll pick up on what you just said, Klan. What role does the federal government play in making the situation more sustainable, quote unquote? I'll throw that to you first, Dan. If at all, I don't want to put an assumption. I mean, on I you. think that the I, I, I'm we're supportive of um, the planned investments in R and D that that are being discussed on the Senate floor as we speak. Um, we're strongly in favor of trying to um, improve security of you know, federal research enterprises. There's been some great work done by Senator Portman looking at um, bipartisan investigations, I should say, looking at how um, the uh, exploitation of intellectual property that Khan was talking about doesn't just happen to companies that go over to, to China. It, it happens at American universities and research centers. You know, those gaps need to be closed, um, particularly if we're about to, to spend $100 billion on, on new R&D. I think that the federal government has, a, um, uh, has been slow on addressing supply chain security issues. It's become an area of bipartisan concern and agreement over the past few years. Um, at least within you know, federal um, networks and federal information systems. Um, that said, that information doesn't always get shared quickly with American consumers and um, others uh, outside the federal government. I think that would be an important role for the for the, um, the federal government to play in this space. Um, there's a lot more that can be done on cybersecurity. I think it's an area of underinvestment when we compare to other you know, strategic you know, global challenges that we face. Um, for a long time, federal government has struggled, uh, DHS in particular has struggled with its work on cybersecurity. We really need to improve there to um, be able to prevent a lot of the um, attacks that are occurring. There's a long list that we could be talking about, but those are some priorities. Yeah, I think philosophically, um, I think the, the place where the government has the most clear constitutional role is uh, where these issues intersect with the, the general idea of providing for the common defense. Um, and um, I think that the national security burden has always been shared between the public and private sector. That's, that there's always been partnerships there that have contributed to the nation's security. Um, but that the, the, the share of that burden does seem to be shifting, that the private sector is is assuming a larger portion of that burden than perhaps ever before. I think that's hard for the federal government to recognize and to deal with the fact that they are a stakeholder and not the stakeholder. Uh, and then I think it's also equally difficult for the industry to deal with it and, and understanding the fact that, you know, they have these responsibilities. They, they are, whether they want to be or not, they are variables in geopolitical calculus. And, uh, and, and while they and I would prefer that they were able to operate as neutral actors and just kind of pursue free markets, um, you know, bad guys like China aren't going to allow them to do that, that, that they, get a vote, they get a vote too. And um, for their own national interest, they're pursuing these companies uh, in a way that won't allow them to operate that way. And uh, that creates then distortions in the global free market that the United States has to account for. And uh, that's hard. And it's messy, and I think that's what you're watching right now: is is policymakers, serious people, think about what is the best way to acknowledge and then roll back those distortions in the global free market that are caused by, I think, dangerous practices by people like China. Really well said. Well, thank you so much, both of you, Dan and Klan, for joining today. Um, we hope you all enjoyed this conversation. Uh, Dan and Klan have both obviously written, spoken, done a lot of really great stuff in this space, so there's plenty to check up on. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.